text that mentioned the women and the women that were they trading to? Were they going in the camel? Were they staying home? Women, well, women were being oh. traded. Uh, well, that's not a good answer, but again, just please look at the Sogdian text that is out there. Uh, it's a sale of a slave girl. Uh, but do we have uh, a uh, businesswoman? Yes, we do. We have seals from late antiquity, uh, probably uh, images of women, and sometimes their names. Uh, and they use seals to put their names, of course, or their signature on commodities. So they definitely are engaged. Now, it happens as any time before uh, modern times. Uh, women tend to get the silent treatment, or they're much more silent in their sources. But other than that, they don't exist. Uh, it's a material culture that tends to give us more ideas. Uh, and again, men are writing about things that are happening and not noticing women to some extent, which is the usual crime of uh, men. Hey, doctor, you mentioned earlier the book of Zimbabwe. I think I got that right. Yes, I must. And you quoted a statement that you said referred to the Buddha. Uh, is the Buddha specifically mentioned in that text as that person? I say this because, and I believe this is even noted in the exhibit here, that Nestorian and Buddhist monks often exchanged ideas back and forth. Because the quote you had there seems very similar to St. Paul's kenosis statement mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Yes, Your very interesting place. question. In fact, in regards to the book of Zambasta and so other uh, uh, texts from Khotan and Maneki and so, there's sometimes this confusion. Is this a Christian text or is this a Buddhist text? Uh, because there's a lot of crossover because of that interaction. In fact, we have a very famous Persian text uh, uh, that's been recently edited. So, it says a text about Buddha, but it's a Christian text in Persian. So there is this problem of overlapping. But the book of Zambasta, at least those who work on um, Buddhism and Khotani texts, invariably say that this is written uh, as a Buddhist text and is about the Buddha. But again, we can check the book of Zambasta. It's the second chapter. It's early on in the text, and we can see the references. At least the person who's edited the late Walter Harold Walter Bailey, if I'm not mistaken, unless Emmerich did that, Johan Emmerich did that, uh, mentions that it's a Buddhist text. So is the Buddha actually mentioned in that text? Johan, is it mentioned? You didn't read your Khotani's text uh, on Zambasa. I think the Buddha is mentioned, but we can actually exchange information. Definitely, it should have been mentioned. Can you tell me what modern countries make up Persia? Uh, I don't know who, who's asking, just so I can look at you. Oh, great. Well, uh, when we talk about Persians, we were talking about people who speak the Persian language in antiquity. So that makes up uh, part of what is modern-day Iran. Uh, that would be largely the place. But Persian is being spoken today in uh, other areas, the Iranian world, Afghanistan, what they call the Dari, and also in Tajikistan, which is called Tajiki. These are the uh, three countries that has Persian language, you might say, as almost the dominant language of the people speaking there. Uh, also in Uzbekistan, there's a minority that uh, speaks Persian. Now, because of nationalism and ideas, these things have been broken up. So Persian, uh, sometimes um, wrongly here, it's called Farsi. Uh, in Iran, of course, it's Persian. Uh, the Afghans because of national, we call it Dari. Dari means language of the court. But you, if you ask which court language, the Sasanian court, the court of Sasanian Iran. Tajiks, uh, again, that is, again, Persian is just given a different term because of dialectal difference. It's not even a dialect, it's somewhat of a dialectal difference. So Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. Here's a microphone coming your way. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the Greek association? I, I'm thinking now of uh, Alexander and his push eastward. Was he interested in the Silk Road, or was he going east for other reasons? Sure. OK. So the idea is, was there a Silk Road already then or not? We, you know, When we mentioned that early on, this seems to be a European conception in the 18th century. Uh, so there is not really a Silk Road, per se. But not only Alexander pushes to the east, we should think of uh, that the Achaemenid Persians already have created a royal road in the 6th century BC and the 5th century BC. 
uh, where it's about 1,600 miles long, gets to Central Asia and goes all the way to the Mediterranean. And what Alexander does is, of course, traverse this very same road. Uh, the issue with Alexander is it's a very short-lived empire. It is a conquest and then death and the division of the empire. So uh, Alexander certainly would have had interest. He, at least more than his, some of his soldiers, he wanted to push east than others did. But uh, in the sense of you know, the Silk Road, everyone can claim, yes, the Achaemenid Persians were thinking of the Silk Road before. Alexander was already the you know, protogenitor of the, uh, this idea of Silk Road. But this is our projection, I think, on what was going on at the time. Is there any record at all as, as to Oh. Well, I think what we get of the Greeks as the group of conquerors and establishing cities, eventually, of course, they will have economic interest, but initially it's a conquest. It's, uh, I would compare it with the Arab Muslims. Uh, initially, there is the idea of conquest, uh, but certainly trade becomes important, and also economy becomes central, uh, but even more for the Arab Muslims and the Greeks, I think. Creation of colonies. Colonization seems to be more of the. First, my heartfelt compliments for a very informative lecture. Thank you. Um, we, uh, I have two questions. One is where do the Al Mitra or Mitraism fit in this scheme of things? And also, in one of your earlier slides, you had Tehran two places. And I wondered why. Yeah, you. the last one, Tehran, I, I didn't make the map. I took it off, and I don't know why there are two Tehran. <laughs> <laughs> or, I've been actually pondering for the past year what Tehran means itself. I've been emailing with a professor at Berkeley who's interested in etymologies, Martin Schwartz, where the term comes from. It's a Tehran or Tigran or where it comes from. Uh, so there should be one Tehran, a more modern term. There shouldn't be two, so that's a mistake. Thank you for saying that. Uh, the second one, I forgot your question already. Oh, Mithra. Uh, Mithraism. You know, I thought about putting Mithraism in there. I thought I would put everybody to sleep by the time I get to Mithra. You know, this was already a long lecture. My attention span usually is about 30 to 45 minutes. I cannot go beyond that, personally. So I think of my listeners as well when I'm doing that. Mithraism, this very interesting international religion as well, but more of an international religion from Armenia to the West, not to the Near East. That is when you find this religion uh, that is associated as a savior religion where this young Persian boy with a Phrygian cap comes and uh, you know, sacrifices the bull uh, for the sin of humanity and sort of uh, goes back to heaven and does this annually again, is very much a uh, Caucasus to the West idea of Mithraism. Mm -hmm. And you don't find really ideas of Mithraism on the Silk Road in the East. Now, Mithra as a deity, an Indo-Iranian deity is there, but it's somewhat different from this young boy, you know, slaying a bull and whatnot with its own specific ceremonies. There is no evidence whatsoever as this type of Mithraic practice being uh, done uh, east of Armenia. There's simply no evidence. 